Right, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry it's freezing in here. That is because it's cold outside. Weather travels, it turns out. And as Len says, if you're feeling cold, it's just because you're a southern softy, uh, just to kick us off in the right uh, mood. So, um, welcome everyone. My name's Torsten Bell. Um, I'm the director of the Resolution Foundation. And we thought it was a good time to talk about politics today. The, um, that's partly because it's kind of still-ish the new year when there's kind of fresh ideas around. You haven't lost all of the big ideas you had over Christmas and been bashed out of you by uh, the real world turning up. That's a good thing. Uh, and hopefully you've got a bit of excitement left. I'm sure the panel have. They're very exciting people. Um, but it's also because it's only one more day till the end of dry, dry January. So even if today goes really badly and you come out depressed about the future of the left, politics and Britain, uh, then you can start dealing with it in two days uh, time. So that's what we're doing. Now we had a similar event to this yesterday about the future of the Conservative Party. The, um, and the big ideas that were around then uh, were more cash for the NHS, the end of austerity, um, the role of the state needing to be a really big positive thing that politicians talk about, and that we needed a more equal sharing of wealth in 21st century uh, Britain. The, um, now, that's a bit odd, because a lot of Conservative MPs were saying that, and some people that have run the Conservative Party. The, um, but it does show that the background to what we're about to discuss is that Labour is winning the battle of ideas, or at least the progressive and the left in Britain is winning the battle of ideas, but it's not in power. And that is one of the paradoxes uh, we want to focus on. And in that context, one of, the, kind of, one of the big questions to come out of this session to think about uh, is, is when we step back and look at the 2010s to 2020 period and the history books are written, they obviously won't be as detailed as the memories of us living this kind of day in, day out. But the history books, if you had to write them today about this decade, would say two things. Britain had a huge financial crisis, the biggest in its history, and then they left the EU. That is basically what the books would say. And everything else that we spend a lot of time thinking about will disappear into the excellently crafted but still page of the Guardian. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't start oh, yet. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come on to Brexit. But, yeah. the, um, anyway, so the question is, is that the kind of history books that progressives think should be the outcome of this decade, or do they want to change those history books? And if they want to change it from that outcome, not just on Brexit, but on other things, what are the things that we can do and the Labour Party and progressive politics can do uh, better on. So that's the purpose of this morning. Hopefully everyone's got the answers to that question. It's very straightforward. You've got to come with a huge idea and a plan for rewriting <laughs> the history books. Uh, and we'll finish all of that in about an hour and 10 minutes. The, um, so the panel to do that on the far uh, left um, as you face us is Lisa Nandy, who is uh, the MP for Wigan and is doing a great job of reminding the Labour Party in particular that there are things called towns and they may not have done brilliantly out of a lot of the last 10 years and that we might need to think about some new ideas to deal with it. Then we're going to hear from Andrew uh, Adonis, Lord, um, who apparently has been busy resigning from things recently, uh, just the National Infrastructure Commission. He also doesn't like vice chancellors. Is there any vice chancellors here? No? Good. That'll keep the social group down. And he's also about 50-50 on Brexit. He's thought about it hard. There are upsides, but on balance, he's anti. The, um, and then on my left is Len McCluskey, who is the General Secretary of Unite the Union, the largest union uh, in Britain, amongst other things, and an early uh, supporter, early and strong supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. And then on the left is Rowena Mason, who is a saint, as well as being deputy political editor of The Guardian, because Anushka, who is the only woman less lucky than all of you today, because she's having to go to China with the Prime Minister, <laughs> this is going to be the most depressing trade mission in history, for a whole host of reasons. So Anushka having to do that, and Rowena has, as a saint, uh, stood in. The, um, and she can defend the Guardian's move to being a tabloid as well as running off on maternity in two days, not in protest at the move to a tabloid, but you never know. So that is the goal. Each of the speakers is going to give us one, at least one big challenge for Labour and one big opportunity. They're going to focus on domestic politics, not on Brexit, because we know as soon as we then open up for Q&A, you're all going to ask us about Brexit anyway. Uh, so we'll get that and then hopefully that will all be solved and everyone can get on with their lives at about 22.11. So that's the plan. I hope you enjoy it. Lisa. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so first of all, if you thought that British politics was a little bit depressing, I just want to tell you that I haven't got a noose round my neck. <laughs> this is a very newfangled type of microphone, apparently, that we've all been issued with. Um, <coughs> Uh, so I just wanted to start by saying that Clement Attlee is one of those very rare things in Labour at the moment, a Prime Minister that all of us in every faction want to try and claim for our own. 
nobody is trying to disown. And as a result, I think his legacy has been hugely distorted. But the comparison that Torsten and the Resolution Foundation have drawn between the time in which Attlee was operating and the time in which we're operating now, I think has some real relevance. Why? Because we face a challenge now that is comparable in scale, if not in context, to the challenge that we faced after the Second World War. I see it all the time in my weekly surgeries. Our failure to grapple with an ageing population and rapid technological change, uh, an economy that delivers growth that isn't fair or inclusive or sustainable, uh, a lack of willingness to do anything about climate change. I see it presenting itself through mental health problems and increasing loneliness, through chronic poverty um, and uh, children who are struggling to breathe. It's no wonder to me then that we've seen a rise in anger, a dramatic rise in support for nationalism and a rise in support for the far right in recent years. And that's before you even begin to consider Brexit. And I expect with the panel you've got this morning, we will consider Brexit at some length. But this was a political earthquake, in my view, that should have led to a fundamental reimagining of what modern Britain is and what it's about. And instead, what we've had in the last year or so is a fundamentally technocratic, sometimes jingoistic response that, in my view, spectacularly misses the point. Brexit exposed a national rupture between two groups of people who have very different ideas about our place in the modern world and very, very different ideas as well about what sort of country we want to be. And those two things have to be reconciled. But there's never been a time, at least in my lifetime, when I felt that collectively we are less equipped for the challenge that we face. Politics has never felt more partisan to me than it does now, not just between the political parties, but actually within them as well. If you begin to consider yourself solely responsible to a political party, Artley warned, you're halfway to a dictatorship. It's left us with politics that is tribal, that is angry, that is trapped in defending thinking that frankly outlived its usefulness 10, 20, 30 years ago. And a political culture that pretends <coughs> that the world is in black and white and not shades of grey will never be able to build the consensus that is demanded of us at the moment. In the Labour Party, we like to remember Attlee as the man who stood out against Ramsay MacDonald in the National Coalition, but we forget the Attlee who played the key role in sustaining national government during the war, the Attlee that told us that the foundation of democratic liberty is a willingness to believe that other people may perhaps be wiser than oneself, and his achievement to build a socialist consensus that la outlasted his government that lasted for decades afterwards, it's very hard, virtually impossible, to imagine that sort of consensus <coughs> being built in Britain today. But here's where we are post the decision to leave the EU. Brexit demands of us precisely those skills. And Labour feels, well, is pulled in two very different directions. We represent some of the most heavily leave-supporting and remain-supporting parts of the country. But our dilemma is the country's dilemma. And what looks like our greatest weakness, weakness should actually be our greatest strength. Because consider what David Lammy's Tottenham and my Wigan have in common, despite this huge divide along age lines, along diversity lines, social attitudes, and Brexit as well. What do they have in common? Labour. So our ability to find consensus in the country has never been more important. And that's why I say it is completely insufficient to pick a side, to call people thick or racist, to call them liberal elites, to willfully close your eyes and ears to what people who you do not know and will not understand are trying to tell us. And nor is it morally acceptable on the right or the left to stoke that genuine sense of grievance and anger on both sides without giving it somewhere clear to go. And that, in the end, is the message from towns like mine. Because if this is supposed to be a working class revolution, then the message of the last 15 years from towns like Wigan is it's frankly not working. Last year's election in a trend that's been a long time coming marked our worst ever showing amongst working class people in towns like Mansfield. It was class politics turned on its head. We gained in areas of economic growth, but in areas of economic decline, after seven years of austerity, people were turning away from us. 
And we should be proud that where people already feel some hope, that once again a reinvigorated, renewed Labour Party, much bolder than two years ago, is finding that people are turning to us. But we should be deeply, deeply worried that where what you find is widespread despair, people are turning away. So credit to us for standing up and being counted, for remembering again in the last couple of years how to speak boldly with the courage of our convictions and to wear our values on our sleeve even where it's difficult. But while we owe a great debt, in my view, to the authors of the manifesto last year, who in just a matter of weeks put together a manifesto for the first time that explained not just what, but why, Never again do I think that we will be allowed to go before the country without a compelling story about economic justice, without concrete plans for social care, and with a welfare plan that, as <coughs> Fabian has rightly pointed out, would push more children into poverty, not less. Attlee was right to say, you will be judged by what you succeed at, gentlemen, and not by what you attempt. So it's in that spirit that I say that one last heave just won't do. The political map is being redrawn. At the Centre for Towns, we released research last year that showed how our age demographics are turning villages overwhelmingly blue and our city's deepest red. And towns are now becoming the key battleground. So this model of growth based on cities pulling along towns in their wake. It won't do. And this economy that's delivered 40% of growth to the richest 10% in my lifetime, it just won't do anymore. And a system that pits the working classes against the middle classes, it won't do either. As our angry debate about tuition fees versus early years spending in the Labour Party shows, our job is not to pick a side. Our job is to change the system so that working class and middle class people aren't left struggling. And that means confronting the economy as it is and not as it was in the 70s or the 90s either. It's right that we seek much greater public control over public goods like the railways and our postal service, but how on earth have we missed the fact that the world's most powerful commodity, data, is owned almost exclusively by five internet companies being used for private good, not public good. Without a progressive thinking Labour government, evolving tech will concentrate power when it should be a powerful tool to disperse it. And that, in the end, for me, is what this is all about. It's about power. There's a reason why take back control caught the mood of the times in towns like mine, <coughs> because we've forgotten in recent years, I think, that our purpose was always about restoring power to people who rightfully own it in its widest sense and not just about redistributing wealth. It's not easy. Attlee's government came to power in an age of solidarity, forged in factories and at the front with a working class that was large, could make itself felt, and strong trade unions as well. It was like now, it was a moment amenable to change. But where does agency lie now? That's the question we on the left need to ask ourselves. It lies in active citizens and in change that is negotiated with those citizens and not imposed. It has to be built in a context that makes sense to people, even more collaborative and plural <coughs> than in the days when the Attlee government formed a great part of its agenda from those great liberals, Keynes and Beveridge. A po it's a politics, frankly, that is completely at odds with our political culture <coughs> in Britain now. But if we've learned one thing in the last few years, this is the thing that always stays with me when I reflect on what's happened. It's that progress isn't inevitable. It can't endure when people are frightened, but it thrives in a confident and empowered society. And just as improving material conditions was a key part of the Attlee government's programme, it will be part of ours. But this too, socialists are not concerned solely with material things. They do not think of human beings as a herd to be fed and watered, but individuals cooperating together to make a fine collective life. For this reason, socialism is more exacting than its competitors. It doesn't demand submission and acquiescence, but active and constant participation. The public have already understood this. They've been trying to tell us this for a long time, and we must remember it again if we want to get into power and change this country for the better. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. <coughs> Andrew. Um, I'm just going to say one word. The, uh, it's, it's very important to understand Brexit is essentially a nationalist right-wing project. 
It's very important for the left to understand that as we take it on. Nigel Lawson, who was the uh, godfather and 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 and, uh, and brains behind Thatcherism uh, and climate change and Brexit, he said of Brexit, letting the cat out of the bag in the Daily Telegraph, that Brexit was the chance to complete the Thatcher revolution. The origins of Brexit are in Margaret Thatcher's Bruges speech of September 1988, which she made. 15 days after Jacques Delors had been at the TUC conference in Bournemouth, where he had pronounced that the Europe of the future was going to be a social Europe. And he set out the agenda for social Europe. So you need to see all that together. Now, coming back to then why we, what we're going to do to, to, to stop it, because Torsten is very agitated. We might be talking about the biggest agitated. issue of the day. So uh, we'll move on to it. Is um, Atlee, Lisa's completely right about Atlee. The thing to understand about the Atlee government is he was resolutely internationalist but also, at the same time, radical about dealing with the social problems at home. The Attlee government was the government that created the United Nations, that, that uh, created NATO, that was, had no truck with nuclear disarmament. Attlee, in a secret committee of three in the cabinet, uh, with Bevin and, and one other tame minister, did the whole of the preparations for, um, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the independent nuclear deterrent. He also sent British troops to Korea, and he was... Uh, the founding speaker of the International Labour Organization. So there was nothing remotely uh, neutralist or soft on defence or anything about Attlee. Indeed, remember, Attlee succeeded Lansbury in 1935. Lansbury had been the pacifist leader. There was this huge debate that took place in Labour in, in the 20s and 30s about pacifism. Attlee was also Major Attlee, who had fought in the First World War and was a great admirer of Churchill, not just in 1940 when they were colleagues in the, in the government together, and Attlee made that government work on the home front. But also, Attlee was the last man off the beach in Gallipoli, and he believed that Gallipoli could have worked. It was the only really exciting and uh, potentially path-breaking strategic idea in the First World War, which was to try and break this appalling uh, uh, situation on, on the Western Front. And he stuck with Churchill all the way through. But what he saw, which Churchill didn't see, was that defending the country was a, a vitally important uh, priority when you're dealing with fascists like uh, Mussolini and Hitler. But you've also got to build a better country, because otherwise is it that you're defending in the first place? And so Major Ackley also went hand in hand with Mayor Ackley, because next year, 2019, is the centenary of Ackley becoming Mayor of Stepney. And when you look to understand the government of 1945, you need to understand Ackley's own experience <coughs> as Mayor of, uh, Lyme, of uh, Stepney, a, 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 a very practically based but radically reforming leader of, a, of what was then. I mean, that was the Wigan. 1910s and 20s, huge overcrowding, massive poverty, uh, col colossal social problems, dealing with the Lloyd George post-war Tory coalition, which was austerity writ large, so there wasn't much money, but he opened public libraries, he championed labour exchanges, which were hugely important in the, in, in, in the, in the day to try and uh, get more people into work, <coughs> and, um, and uh, he did, uh, opened children's centres, he did a whole lot of progressive things within the realm of the possible, which all became in his thinking, a kind of blueprint for 1945, which was very radical, but very practically focused. And as, um, as uh, Lisa so rightly says, also essentially pluralistic too. He would take good ideas from wherever they came. You know, the Beveridge report, Beveridge was a liberal MP. Keynes, probably the greatest liberal philosopher, because I regard economics as a philosophy, not a science, the greatest uh, philosopher that this country has produced in the, uh, since Adam Smith, probably, um, or, or John Stuart Mill. I mean, he borrowed all these ideas that were crucially important to the whole way that that government worked. So the big question facing us today is what would an Atlee government do now? And I just wanted to talk about that for, for two or three minutes. First, it would be resolutely internationalist. It would have no truck with taking this country out of its major international alliances, withdrawing from the European Union, damaging trade. Atlee would have regarded all that as juvenile. He, he had no truck at all for people who had these sort of weird um, ideas of somehow wrenching, destroying the things When it comes to dealing with the, the, the big challenges that we face at the moment, he would have been absolutely resolute and hard-headed in dealing with this chronic problem that we had of poverty across about half to two-thirds of Britain. To be blunt about it, the half to two-thirds of Britain that hasn't been going to university, that hasn't had the huge investment which under Labour and Tory governments over the last generation we've put in those who have uh, succeeded at school and uh, who at the moment are in low-paid jobs or no a large proportion of them on welfare, 
who don't have decent places to live because housing, which is another huge priority of Attlee's, one of the biggest things he did as mayor of Sydney was to deal with what he called congestion, massive overcrowding and slum conditions, which still apply across so much of the country at the moment, particularly as, as council housing has declined and the private rented sector has become the norm now for people who need, who, who need, um, who need lower uh, cost housing. And he would have been resolute about tackling all of those. Now, I can't deal with all of them. But let's take education. What should we be doing in education? What would an active government be doing in education now? It would not be, let's be blunt, prioritising university students at the moment who have had huge additional uh, investments over the last 20 years. It would be doing a London Challenge approach to boosting underperforming schools in the rest of the country outside London, which hasn't had the big investment that London's got. London has had probably the biggest improvement in its school system of any major city in the world over the last 20 years. Labour should take huge pride in that because we brought it about, but we now need the same to happen in Wigan, in Manchester, in Blackpool, in, um, in, in Leeds and so on. We need all of that to happen. Secondly, we have got to get hard-headed about this <coughs> issue of school exclusions. 60,000 kids a year, one way or another, are permanently or temporarily excluded. Blackpool, not very far from Lisa's constituency, has a pupil referral unit, which is a euphemism for an, an institution for which, from which kids are expelled to go to, which has 400 children in it. 400 children in 2018. That's equivalent to an entire secondary school of kids who have basically been thrown on the scrap heap and ostracised by their schools. My own view is that we should no longer allow exclusions to take place in schools. It may be that very disruptive kids can't be educated in the classroom alongside others, but schools should take responsibility for them. They should be given they should be supported because so many of these kids end up in the criminal justice system within months of being expelled from schools. Thirdly, private schools. I spent 10 years trying to get private schools to take reform seriously, to set up academies, to make big investments in the state system and all of that. They weren't having it. They got the most highly paid lawyers in the country on my case. They took over the Charity Commission. Notice, by the way, that the Conservatives have just appointed a fourth of the House of Lords to chair the Charity Commission, so there ain't going to be any reform of the public schools anytime soon. We've got to leapfrog this, and the way to leapfrog it, in my view, is we should impose a big tax on private school fees. I think we should have an education opportunity tax of 25% on private school fees. It should pay for two things. It should pay for endowing the National Education Service, which Jeremy Corbyn has rightly talked about, and which could start tackling schools in Lisa's constituency and others, particularly giving bonuses to teachers teach them to get the best teachers also provide for all of those facilities which middle-class kids in private schools take for granted, music, art, sports, this extended education, and we should pay for it in state schools too. Next, apprenticeships. Uh, amazingly, with the apprenticeship levy that the government's introduced in the last year, which I support the apprenticeship levy, the number of apprenticeships has halved. Now, how does that make sense of that? Uh, I really don't know, but that we need now to ins insist that the number of apprenticeships goes up. And the state should lead. And the state should lead by ensuring that in all large state institutions, starting with the civil service, there should be as many apprenticeships offered as there are graduate opportunities offered. And this should happen within the next two or three years, which would transform opportunities for people who aren't on the, on the, uh, on the graduate ladder. Tuition fees, the right thing to do, in my view, is to do what we did, which is to have a contribution by students to the cost of their university education. I thought £3,000 was about right. It was about half the cost, but not expect expecting them to bear the whole of the brunt of it. So we should go back down from 9500 which we now are, down to 3000 And then finally, you need people in educational institutions, because they're public figures, to lead. And so they should, vice chancellors should halve their salaries, they should not live in palaces, and they should behave as mere mortals. Uh, that's one bit of the Atlee settlement, but we need to do the same in housing, we need to do the same in the health service. There's a lot to do. But the starting point is we must not scapegoat foreigners and Europe for all of the problems of left behind Britain. So we need an active government, but we need to stay in the European Union. We should be resolutely reformist, but resolutely internationalist. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> should we do that all in the first month of the government? Or is well, that, is that just the case? Atlee did quite a lot in the first month, actually. Right. He was quite active. Len. <coughs> Uh, well, good morning, everybody. First of all, I'm delighted to be here, and I've enjoyed the contribution so far. There's two other reasons why I'm particularly pleased to be here. One is that here I am, a trade unionist on a resolution foundation platform. 
a rare occurrence, and hopefully Torsten, Not at all. it won't be the last. Uh, the second reason, of course, is I'm the only panellist that was right about Jeremy Corbyn. At a time when the PLP were hawking themselves around uh, TV studios and the shadow cabinet, his first shadow cabinet resigned in a damaging and coordinated fashion, Unite stood firm. It was easy for us to have resolution to stand firm because, of course, we don't tick to the same metronome as Westminster. Our rhythm is somewhat different. We take our feelings and thoughts and ideas from the shop floor and from the factory gates. And, of course, they were telling us that the old order, the political order, was crumbling. And in that sense, something different was happening. And we knew they'd been telling us for years in Scotland that things were wrong. Eventually, in 2015, turning against uh, Labour, away from Labour. They told us when we launched our Remain campaign uh, all across the country, they rejected Many, many of our members rejected, even in those industries that desperately rely on what Europe can offer us. So we knew that that was happening. So for us, not the gossip or the corridor plots in the House of Commons, but the sense of change that was taking place within uh, our own membership, within the real world that people live and work in. And you know, Confirmation of that came in the election uh, last year, when Corbyn, who was being blamed for the destruction of Labour, came so close to power. You could even say that he was the saviour of the party. And in that context, it's important to recognise where we come from in order to see where we can go forward. I wonder, had there not been those damaging and useless coups that were taking place, whether today we'd actually be talking about a Labour government delivering a new settlement. And that's always important to bear in mind because as we try to unite the party, there are still areas, there are still those who seek, instead of looking for what is common between us, seek to find things that try uh, to divide us and in a sense that's one of the great challenges that we have. You know, Attlee faced a similar situation. A decade before he came to power, working class people were voting Tory and yet on that crucial 1945 vote they voted for a socialist government. They voted for the creation of a welfare state. They voted for the National Health Service to be born. They voted for universal education. They did that on the basis of challenging the five evils that Beveridge had actually highlighted. Want, squalor, ignorance, disease, and idleness. But they voted for something else. They voted for a great cause, a great purpose. They voted to repair a country that had been devastated by war. But they voted on the basis that they didn't want it put back together in the old ways. They wanted to refashion it as something new for the people, for the many, not the few. And that's the starkest parallel that we find with Corbyn at the moment. The situation, Torsten said to us, well, what are the challenges? What can we look for? What opportunities exist? Well, this is a moment in time, a moment of history. They happen throughout history. There's a particular point in time where change takes place. We've just seen the collapse of Carillion. And what that signals is a complete breakdown, crumbling, of the economic philosophy and dogma that has dominated world economics for 40 years, neoliberalism. The one that's 
shackled our political thinking for so long demonstrators that it's wrong. Incidentally, the trade unions were right there as well. We said that you cannot bring marketplace ethics into public services. You simply can't do that. It won't work. It leads to massive undercutting and instability. It's not just Carillion, the banks, the uh, university education that... Uh, Andrew's done so much about the NHS, transport, energy. All of this has demonstrated that this model isn't working and doesn't work. It's a model that sweats the assets, grabs the cash, and then leaves us to pick up the tab. So there's a great opportunity at the moment for us to effectively offer something different and that is the beauty of Corbyn that's exactly what he does him and John MacDonald tremendously brave people for the first time in 40 odd years are actually challenging an economic system an economic system that has failed and has created more and more um, inequality in our country and that's where they need to be given their support because people have had enough they don't want the same anymore. The Tories are the only ones now trying to defend this particular position. And if politicians of any colour don't recognise that people have had enough, then they will fail. And so, what challenges exist for Corbyn and Labour? Well, they have to very evidently be seen as a government in waiting. I know we're going to talk about Brexit, and I'm interested in what you have to say and what questions you put to us. You may be interested in some of my answers. But the reality is that you, Labour have to look like a government in waiting. United, clear of purpose, and economically disciplined. And that is what is being created at the moment. It's an exciting period that we're going through. And because people don't want the same, I actually do believe we're going to get a Corbyn government. I think that government has to rise to this challenge of the changing nature of the society in which we live in. But I think it needs to go beyond the 1945 uh, ambitions of, of Attlee. We need to effectively shift the balance of power in favour of working people, irreversibly in favour of working people, a terminology we've been using for many, many years. But that requires courage. It requires bravery. It requires the type of courage that Corbyn has demonstrated in bucketfuls. You know, it's one thing to want a changing world, but it's something else to actually put that into practice. I believe that we can do that. And I say to, and to my friends in the Resolution Foundation, uh, listen to someone who's got it right a few times of late and come and join us. Come and join us. Come and support Labour and what Corbyn is attempting to do to create a better world for the many and not the few. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Rowena. Everybody, um, lots of fascinating policy in insights so far, um, and I don't want to overlap too much. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk briefly about uh, Labour's place and Labour's uh, policies in the wider political landscape, um, and like Len, talk in terms of one big uh, opportunity for Labour over the next year and one big risk for them as well. So, in terms of opportunity for Labour and policy, um, I think the biggest one is that there is this absolutely huge gaping hole in the field where government policy would usually be. And the party in number 10 <coughs> at the moment has had to basically retract a huge amount from its manifesto on grammars um, <coughs> and on social care. And then when it tried to come out with some policies over the party conference season, um, it was accused of either stealing ideas from Labour or fiddling around the edges. 
when you look over to Lib Dems and they're basically nowhere. Their, um, their flagship idea to win over the public has been curry visas from Vince Cable. Um, and then you look at UKIP and it's, it's effectively imploded. So there's this great big open goal there at the moment for Labour. Um, and there was a, a, a fantastic base uh, for policy ideas at the manifesto. Um, uh, and now there is this real chance for the party to hammer home some of those ideas. Andrew was talking about um, an actually government being both radical and practical. That's what some of those manifesto ideas were. They were clear, simple and memorable, bold without sounding too scary to swing voters. If you look at things like a national education service, the massive programme of council house building, <coughs> an end of privatisation to the NHS and this re returning it to its post-war state, nationalising the railways. All of those things completely compatible with an Attlee settlement for the 21st century. Um, and perhaps uh, uh, familiar sounding to, to older voters, and fresh sounding for younger ones. So now we know the Shadow Cabinet is busy at the moment, um, developing more policy, building on that building on that manifesto that was put together so quickly um, uh, during the short election campaign. Um, but now is the time to make some noise and, and to not just critique government policies, but actually to fill that space, look like the government in waiting. And it might be tempting at the moment to sit back and let the Conservatives tear themselves apart, um, enjoy the spectacle of... Uh, Theresa May's MPs um, trying to get rid of her and, and saying that she's, she's not good enough policies. But what Labour um, has this great opportunity to do is to be out there making speeches, getting on the airwaves, talking about all those policies, building on them, building on all the ideas from the manifesto. Um, so if Labour's serious about being election ready, it needs to be out on the pitch. Um, uh, big set piece speeches from shadow cabinet ministers, or if, if that's too old politics, then rallies using the um, great pulling power of Jeremy Corbyn to bring people in and make people listen. Um, and some people might say it's too early in the electoral cycle to be doing that. There's a risk that uh, Labour policies will be stolen, uh, stolen by the government, like with the energy cap. Um, but actually, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, and um, it's, it's just a huge opportunity um, to hammer home not just policies, but Labour values, and press the case that uh, Labour is a, is a party of competence on the economy, um, as well as public services. So, um, just I'm, I know we're not meant to be mentioning Brexit, but Brexit, there's, there is this golden opportunity when it comes to economic credibility and competence where Brexit is concerned, because Labour can really make the case there that uh, where the, the Conservatives are the supposed party of, of business um, and, uh, uh, and a strong reputation on the economy, actually what they're doing with Brexit is, is um, undermining that and destroying it. So moving on to the, to the risks, um, Again, I'm not meant to be talking about Brexit, but um, I'll just file Brexit under the, uh, under the central theme of divisions. Um, the biggest risk for Labour in the next year, I think, is looking divided. Um, and with Brexit, you've, you've got all sorts of policy conflicts that need to be ironed out, sorted out. Um, the big risk is, is looking like a party at war, and we've already got the Conservatives doing that, so Labour really doesn't want to follow um, them down that uh, rabbit hole. Um, <coughs> So uh, more widely than that, I mean, there are other things like that, are, that could potentially cause divisions. Um, anything that makes the party look divided, like review of the party democracy and structures, very important though it is. It's just so crucial to kind of keep on track, um, uh, not not look like the party's turning inwards, being insular, fighting itself um, rather than the Conservatives. Great, thank you very much. <coughs> if politics is about keeping promises, then we have broken every single one because that was 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, anyway, but, you know, you got such high quality that it was worth the wait. So now why don't we have um, questions, or at least you, what you've actually got is a <coughs> pretend to raise your voice at the end so that it sounds like it's a question. There's a gentleman at the front, right next to you, Will. William Claxton-Smith, among other things, a school governor. And I was specifically interested in Andrew's comments on exclusions that are... Uh, clearly is a problem on the scale he's talking about. But I know my own headmistress is extremely reluctant to exclude, but she's doing it when she does it for those who are not being excluded because 
that the very disruptive children are making life very difficult for those who are not disruptive. Uh, Alison Potter, the London Borough of Newham. Um, uh, Attlee started his career in local government and he was motivated by slum landlords who were charging high rents um, and providing uninhabitable conditions. That was 99 years ago in East London and that's still the case today. I'd be really interested to hear what the panel think is the solution to that and what an Attlee settlement for local government and for housing conditions would look like. Do you want to, while you've still got the mic, do you want to give us a sales pitch for what, what's the energetic ideas coming out of Newham? So in Newham we have a landlord licensing scheme, which means that we prosecuted uh, 1,200 criminal landlords. Um, that's over half of all prosecutions in London alone. Um, but this licensing scheme um, has just been up for renewal. So effectively, the similar powers local authorities elsewhere aren't able to have and access. Okay, great. One more question. And then we spread to the wings for the next question. Maybe I'll keep some of the uh, is, is NEC involvement in local government new politics or old? Okay. What do you call it's a Harringay question. Oh, right. Should, right. Be Should the NEC tell? Great, right. Tell I want to start um, on exclusion. So William's basically answered your question. Um, it may not be appropriate for seriously disruptive kids to be in the classroom. The issue is whether they should be excluded from the school entirely. Once they're excluded from the school entirely, at that point, people lose track of what they're doing and their chances of getting back on track, getting serious qualifications and into decent jobs vanishes. And the right way to proceed, I I'm now convinced, is that, it, it is that exclusions from school, apart from cases where there were a, a criminal offences which happen, I mean, they may, it may get very, very serious, but uh, short of that, and most exclusions aren't in that territory, that they shouldn't take place. Uh, that schools should be properly funded to make provision, which may be outside the classroom, but shouldn't be outside the school, and the school should continue to take ownership of them and their future. And that the bit that really absolutely needs to be uh, tackled immediately is this business of, of what is effectively informal exclusions of kids in order to massage exam <coughs> results and to impress Ofsted. That, I think, is absolutely scandalous. Shouldn't be allowed. We shouldn't have children being used as pawns in a game of league tables and if we could sort all of that <coughs> out, that would dramatically improve the life chances of tens of thousands of children a year we've just got to have a new settlement there can i just deal very quickly with the quick. the, the, the housing thing we've got to get local authorities building homes again the last generation local authorities have stopped building homes you can have a difference of opinion on whether right to buy was the right thing my own view is that it was right that people should have been able to buy but not with subsidies the state shouldn't have given subsidies are but the absolutely crucial thing was that local authorities should have been able to continue building they should now be allowed to borrow to build and i have absolutely no doubt at all that the first step of an atley government today would be <coughs> to lift the borrowing cap on local authorities let get them building again and there'll be nothing that would be a more powerful driver for tackling slum landlords lisa and just on the exclusions issue there's a very simple way that you can deal with this because i see it in wigan too and that's to make schools responsible for the results of those children who they're seeking to exclude so they may not physically be in the actual school themselves but it'll still show up on how they're measured so they'll retain a responsibility for it i have to say too i know we're trying to build a consensus here but you know that actually wigan schools are very very good schools and have always been very good schools because uh, unlike in london most children have to go to their own local school. So there is a community-based incentive to make every single school a good school. The one thing that's really caused problems for us, actually, is the academies and free schools programme, the Labour one as well as the Tory one, which has fragmented that local family of schools and has led to schools becoming seeing themselves much more as islands within the community rather than part of the broader community themselves. So it's a slightly different view, I think, from outside of London than it is potentially from within it. Just on this point about local government, because I think it all links and I think it's really important. I see the real uh, energy in Labour over the last uh, seven years since I've been in Parliament coming from local government. And there's something that really strikes me about that. We've not been in power now, nationally, for nearly eight years. So for a lot of those young people coming out to vote in this general election last year, they can't really remember a time when Labour was in power. It's no use banging on all the time about what we did or didn't do in government because frankly to them that's irrelevant they want to understand 
why they can trust Labour <coughs> to deliver now. And local government is doing that. We are in power in almost every major town and city across this country. And I've seen no better example of this, actually, than in the field of energy, where Labour councils have led the way in restoring municipal and community energy, breaking up a fragmented, uh, monopolised energy market, and starting to give people real power back into their own hands. While we were talking about it in Westminster, they were actually doing it in their communities. And that's why I think it would be a really worrying turn of events if a political party body was saying to councils that are on the coalface of some of the worst things that are happening to people in our communities, this is how you have to do your job. And I just say this to Len, I have a huge amount of respect for your Unite officials, I work with them very closely in my own constituency as well as at Westminster and I very much agree with you that they are closely connected to what is happening to people in the world of work. But politicians too have to be directly accountable to local people. We have to be directly connected to what they're saying to us. And the growing rift between what I hear from Labour members and what I hear from the constituents that I live and work amongst side should worry us all, not just me. And that's why I say that we have to listen more to local councils because our local councillors are embedded in those communities, labour to their core, but trying their best to deal with the world as it is, <coughs> not just as they would like it to be. Great. Len? Just quickly on um, Alison's point with housing, because I agree wholeheartedly with what Andrew has said. Andrew will make a Corbyn Easter of you. Yeah, the reality is that... Um, uh, housing, I believe, at the next general election is going to be one of the central issues that will determine the outcome of the election. And, of course, Labour's policy under Corbyn is very much one of building more homes, bringing regulations in that you've already done in relation to, um, in relation to slum landlords. And it is a terrible stain for the progressive left in our nation. Here we are in 2018, and you're asking a question and saying 99 years later, nothing is changing. And that's precisely why I was making the point in my contribution that this irreversible shift in the power and wealth of our nation has to be tackled. It's a lovely phrase and saying, but it has to be dealt with in terms of the powers that exist. Corbyn, the manifesto, Rowena said that we have to build on that. She's absolutely correct. It was a brilliant manifesto, and it needs to be built on. It needs to be changed in areas that are not quite clear or capturing the public imagination. And so I see that as absolutely essential. Um, you know, Lisa's point about local government, uh, she is right. They often are at the brunt of criticism from all quarters, including people like me, um, they're in a difficult situation. But again, this is something that, as a movement, we need to tackle. Because uh, she's right, more and more cities are labour-controlled. And yet they are being asked to implement Tory cuts. And it's those Tory cuts that are causing all kinds of problems in relation to what a specific local authority will do. That's a great idea. We need to find some money in order to save this particular service. Why don't we do that? But if that then impacts on the national perception of Labour, then I don't necessarily agree with you, Lisa, that the national input shouldn't come into play. We need to give a lot more support to our councillors, but we need to try to see if we can create a network that joins councils together in a way that says we won't implement these cuts. We will move to a different form using the reserves that many, many councils have but will not actually use to stem the unbelievable attacks that are still taking place. Difficult situation, but austerity, a word that we haven't used so far, and incidentally, something that Corbyn, in his first nine months as leader of the Labour Party, turned Labour from an austerity party to an anti-austerity party. You don't hear any Labour politicians, MPs or in the Lords now, saying we agree with austerity. Everybody is anti-austerity. It was Corbyn who actually did that 
in a very, very short space of time. But austerity is still what's harming our local councils, our, our people, real people, people that Lisa meets every single week in her constituencies with heartbreaking stories. And we, as a movement, need somehow to have the courage to grasp that nettle and say, we're not prepared to continue to do this. We're going to try to create a way in which we can oppose this diktat from government that tells us that we've got to do their dirty work for them. Great. Let's get um, a few more questions done because we're going to run out of time. And then we'll, the panel is going to try a lot harder to give short answers this time. The gentleman there. Um, I'm Dan Saber from The Guardian. As my colleague Rowena sort of eloquently pointed out, one of the to risks... Ask Rowena a question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, <laughs> Rowena can come in as she sees fit. Um, uh, as my colleague Rowena eloquently pointed out, one of the great risks for Labour is division, is division in this time. And I just also wanted the sort of panellists to talk about this question. Does Labour need some kind of... Given the conflict and the battles that are going on on the ground in the constituencies and many constituencies between perhaps different factions of the, of the party, is there a need for some kind of reconciliation or, or, or some kind of process where Labour moves forward from that sort of localised conflict? Okay, great question. Um, there's a gentleman just then directly behind. If any one of the non-male persuasion would like to ask a question, that'd be great. Um, hi, I'm Afzal from Citizens Advice. Um, I think we'd all agree that a defining feature of the Attlee government was a massive expansion in social security benefits. Um, for the rich, um, for unemployed people, for sick people, uh, for families of children. And the recent manifesto I thought was brilliant, but it didn't promise anything comparable to Atlee in terms of reform on social welfare. Um, so I just wondered what the panelists thought, uh, how much of a priority social security and the benefit system should be for the left in this uh, moment of change. Great question. And one more. Okay, there's a gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I just came back from America. I've been 15 years in America. Was a member of President Obama's kitchen cabinet, on formal, and also a member of a party for 40 years. But I just want to ask a question about about uh, because Labour tend to be over the years, from 60s onwards, always eat themselves up. And is there any sort of people who can bring those factions together? Because it's, I was present yesterday at the Tory uh, stop. There is a real fear among the Tories that Jeremy coming and go to the, I never saw that before in my life. They were scared of Jeremy. There was a lot of fear in the room yesterday that Labour is going to win power. So, but Labour has to put his, his, his act together. All this fighting going on. What was your name, sir? What was your name? Stephen Del Sol. Stephen. Great. Right. Why don't we, um, why don't we do um, Dan and Stephen's questions together, the, um, which is basically um, how much is division a risk? Can we have a record? <laughs> well, I actually think the media uh, try to um, create more of a division than there is. I mean, I suppose uh, on the one hand you talk about the conflicts within the local party. By that you mean the advent of momentum and the challenges that they are saying. The Labour Party is now the largest political party in Western Europe. When from 180,000 members to 600,000 members. When you've got 600,000 members, there's obviously differences of opinion. I've been a member of the Labour Party for 48 years, and I can never remember a time where there wasn't argument and disagreement and division. Very often I was in the minority. So let's not kind of highlight too much division as though it's a problem. It's a problem because the right-wing media will try to make it a problem. That's why we've had all of the stuff flowing around about misogyny and anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. It's trying to create an image that the Labour Party <coughs> is somehow a toxic party. And that's why I said before when I was talking that we do need to be united. And that means people recognising differences, dealing with each other in a respectful manner, uh, but then accepting what a majority view is. And I believe that's the issue. I also, and nobody's even mentioned Brexit yet, but the issue about division. Every time I pick a newspaper, including The Guardian, I'm being told that there's this terrible division within the Labour Party. It's come 
out again today. Why doesn't Corbyn get off the fence? Well, he's well off the fence in terms of Brexit. And Labour's position on Brexit, the leadership's position on Brexit, is crystal clear to me. Now, of course, you've got Chuck Ramuna, you've got uh, people like Heidi Alexander and Alison McGovern today. Another, another group has been created. Andrew, pro-Europeans, understandably concerned. My union uh, campaign strongly for Remain. But Labour's position is the only one, in my view, that speaks for the whole nation. It is crystal clear. It speaks for the 48%. First of all, he says, we've had a referendum, and we accept the results of the referendum. We are coming out of Europe. It says for the 48%, we intend to have uh, a access, access as opposed to membership, access to the single market and the customs union, which will protect jobs and investment. Music to my ears and my members in manufacturing. It says to the 52% that coupled with our industrial strategy, people who voted to leave did so for two main reasons. They were left behind in the wastelands, especially in the north, not cities, but towns, as Lisa has quite, quite rightly highlighted, but also on the issue of immigration. And Labour speaks to that by saying, when we leave Europe, freedom of movement ends. But we have to have something in its place. And Labour has effectively said, what we will do in those circumstances is introduce labour market regulations to stop the abuse of migrant workers. Migrant workers are to blame for nothing in this country. It's the greedy bosses who seek to use a cheap pool of labour to drive down this, this race to the bottom culture that we have in Britain. What Labour and Corbyn says is we will create a rate, a rate for the job society with labour market regulations. Labour's policy on Brexit is clear. And my appeal to those good people, including Andrew and many other good people who are very pro-European, is to recognise where we are going recognize the fact that a referendum has taken place and therefore the divisions that Dan raises don't need to be regurgitated in a way that uh, uh, creates an unnecessary image that the party is divided. Because if you take the lead from, uh, from our leader, I don't think we're divided at all and I think we speak for the whole of our nation. Okay, great. Now, Rowena, why... Um <laughs> I, I, I think there are some divisions on Brexit that can't really be swept under the carpet. I mean, as, as clear as the, the leadership's position on Brexit is, um, there are, you know, w w which is that Labour has accepted that we're leaving the EU um, and it wants as much access to the single market as possible um, and that free movement will end but a new immigration system will, will come in in its place. There are still a lot of people who voted for Labour and who are members of, of Labour who would like us to stay in the EU and us just to ha us have a close as possible relationship with the EU as possible. So that still hasn't has not been reconciled. On the other hand, you've got lots of um, Labour voters in 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 the heartlands who voted very strongly to leave and thought that leaving would solve a lot of um, domestic problems. That's partly what they were promised by the Leave campaign. So I don't I don't think I don't think that has that has been. Um, those two sides have yet been reconciled, and obviously the Conservatives are facing exactly the same problems in their party, but the whole country is in fact driven with division on that, that issue. Okay. So you're not going to stop it? I'm afraid not. Okay, great. Well, this is clear. You tried, Len. <coughs> Lisa, um, I can so make sure we touch on the social security question as well? Yeah, well actually, so just, can I just, just pick that. up very briefly on something that Len said? I don't think he meant it like this, but can I just be absolutely clear that Wigan is not a wasteland? Um, it's actually a very nice place to live, like most of the towns. I used to country. live in Wigan. In fact, I know you did. <laughs> I, keep, I keep tabs on you. Um, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, if, you know, but like most of the towns that voted to leave um, the EU in the referendum a couple of years ago, uh, these are not places where people have nothing left to lose. These are places where people felt so strongly that they wanted to express that anger through the Brexit vote precisely because they still have something left to lose. They've seen life get harder and harder over the last 30 
years. They've seen all of the things that really matter, like thriving local high streets and community institutions and time with children and stability and dignity at work eroded gradually over that time. And the Brexit vote was very clearly, as they told me in Sunderland and Middlesbrough and Wigan, this was their chance to get us to sit up and listen and finally wake up and do something about it. Now, we can argue, and actually I don't expect there'd be much between me and Andrew, about the implications of Brexit and the potential major problems that Brexit can then cause for that group of people. But, um, but the, the truth is that if we don't sit up and take notice of what they were trying to tell us, then Labour is going to be in a very, very bad place indeed come 2020, 2021, 2022, whenever the next election is. And welfare goes right to the heart of this, actually. Because, well, we've got to be ready, haven't we? But it goes to the heart of this, actually, because what is so clear about Britain, as opposed to so many other countries, is that we leave our state to do far too much heavy lifting. And I see it, the impact of that in my constituency every day. Work simply doesn't pay. So we get into these arguments about whether we can protect benefits for the very, very poorest people with disabilities for whom actually that income is a lifeline to enable them to continue to participate and have dignity versus whether we can protect tax credits for families who are struggling to think how they're going to pay their mortgage and when they're next going to have a holiday with their kids. We should never have allowed ourselves to get into that situation. So it demands a completely different approach that isn't just tinkering around the edges, but is the wholesale reform of the way that we reward work in this country um, that I think Attlee would have been quite proud of. Can I just say one thing on the on the Labour Party? Because I, I didn't really disagree with a lot of what Len said, actually. I mean, I, I read a lot of this in the papers. Um, I've, seen some, I've seen the development in Labour that I think is a bit troubling over the last few years, but it's nothing like the sort of things that I read every day in the media. And it's this, that I think there is a bit of a tension going on in Labour between the vast majority of us who have always seen us as a broad church of opinion coming from very different traditions who can debate respectfully and by doing so can hear what the public are trying to tell us in very different parts of the country and can respond accordingly. And a very small minority of people who believe that we should be a narrow faction only representing one strand of opinion. Now, that small group of people in recent years, we've heard a lot about them on the left, but actually the extreme right and the extreme left of the Labour Party, to me, are mirror images of one another in that respect. And when they fight each other, the vast majority of us in the middle are left behind and left without a voice. And that is what cannot be allowed to happen. There's a very simple way for people like me and Len and Andrew to deal with that, and that is to set a better tone. And I like to think, hopefully, that that's what we're doing today. So you better be nicely mm. toned now. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I wanted to go, go back to Atlee, because in, 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 on this issue of Europe, because the two are related. Atlee was a supremely unsuccessful electoral politician. He fought <laughs> 10 general elections. Labour, while he was uh, active in politics, lost eight of those elections. It lost, by my quick calculation, six of them outright to the Tories, most of them to Tory landslides. Labour only won one convincing majority in his entire ten elections. That was 1945. It scraped home in 1950. And there were minority Labour governments in 1924 and 1929. But in the 1929 one, of course, Labour actually managed to lose its prime minister to the Conservatives within two years, which wasn't a great achievement. So Atlee certainly didn't take <coughs> one defeat as meaning, you know, let alone... Uh, he didn't like referendums, by the way. He regarded them as the instrument of fascism. And he ensured that they didn't appear in the German constitution. So we won't go there. But he certainly didn't regard one defeat as a reason why you give up, walk away, say this is a pronounced defeat, and you don't carry on struggling. As democratic socialists, things that we believe in are going to, because you're engaged in, a, in a, a big, big campaign to move the country, are going to be a big struggle. But what we should always do as a party is focus on the country and not the party. What matters, why we're in politics, is to change the country. Um, if I can be slightly disunited for a moment, my great hero in politics is Roy Jenkins, who was a supremely successful minister. This is the guy who brought about the social revolution of the, of the, um, of the 1960s, the legalisation of homosexuality, abortion, no-fault divorce, did more probably than anything else that the Wilson government did to change society. He's the only president of the European Commission that, that this country has produced. 
his line always was that political parties are vehicles, they are not tabernacles. They are only worthwhile to the people of this country while they deliver improvements for them. The two big improvements that we need at the moment and which the Labour Party exists for, in my view, are to deal with the social crisis, which is massively afflicting large parts of the country, partly because of the financial crisis of 2008, but partly because of long-term systemic problems about left-behind Britain, about insufficient good quality jobs, about an education system that doesn't work properly, a health service that's too much, an illness service, not a health service, all of that. But the other big problem is this far-right coup that is taking place to take us out of the European Union and to out of the whole system of international regulation and uh, trade engagement that we've got in order to dismantle the social state here in Britain. Now, those are huge things that Labour needs to address. We need to a strategy to stay in the European Union, a strategy to deal with the social crisis. If that can't unite us, then goodness knows what the Labour Party needs to do that's going to get us focused on the country rather than internal divisions. Great. Let's get one last set of questions and then let's release people to the freezing cold. There's a man in the middle and a lady right in front of him. And there's a lady. Um, I'll just make a comment first, if I may. Um, I've recently resigned, um, retired from working as a lawyer in local government in Lewisham and have watched with despair the party tear itself apart. I have to say a little bit stoked up by a Guardian journalist, but they wasted years destroying each other and not working for the best of the people. But the question I would ask is on housing, building new houses is one solution. But we do have existing stock and a massive problem with buy to let, uh, which is eating up a lot of the stock and unlawful subletting. Even, I have to say, that recent shared ownership developments in Canada Water, Islington, etc., have hardly been on the market before they were even bought up by people under a buy to let program. And these are tricky problems which a Labour government will have to fa face building new properties unless the use of them is controlled will not be the solution. Okay, great. Another gentleman behind you. The 2017 manifesto uh, didn't contain any significant taxes on wealth, property or inheritance. And I struggle to see how you can really call a manifesto radical without that. As the Resolution Foundation no, there's, inequality is a huge problem, but in this country it's predominantly a problem of inequality of wealth, not inequality of income until you get to this 0.1 percentile of, 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 of earners. Um, is that something we're likely to see for, 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 from, the, from the Labour Party? Um, yeah, be interested to hear your thoughts. Just a plug, we'll be publishing several papers on excellent ways to tax wealth in the next few months. Brilliant. <laughs> if they want to come looking, we will have them ready and waiting. And the lady here. Um, my name's Eve, and I'm here in a personal capacity as a young member of the Labour Party and a young Fabian. And I'd like to take issue with, um, if I may, with Len's contention that Labour have a strategy for leaving the EU and that it's one that satisfies the needs of both the 48 and the 52%, because... As far as I can see, we're pursuing a strategy of, well, strategic prevarication, you know, just shifting slightly further than the Tories on Brexit. And as a young person who's been a member of the Labour Party for over 10 years, since I was 13, I contend that the Labour Party, in turning its back on my generation and, you know, crashing towards a hard Brexit because of its failure to present an alternative, we are consigning ourselves to electoral defeat for generations to come. And... Why is Corbyn not taking a stronger stance on this? Okay. The, um, right, Andrew, we're going to lose you to the House of Lords. So do you want to give your last I've, 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 got to go to, I've got to go to the House of Lords to speak on the EU withdrawal bill with 195 others over the next two days. So I'm sorry. Guys. But I, I don't do prevarication, you may have noticed. I have that strongly in common with Jeremy, who I respect because he, he tells it straight and I tell it straight. The right thing for this country is to stay in the European Union. The right for this party is to campaign to stay in the European Union. People did not know what the terms were two years ago. They couldn't because they hadn't been negotiated. They will know the terms later this year. We are not and should not sign up to a Tory plot to take us out of Europe so they can dismantle the social state at, uh, here at home. So we need a referendum for the people to decide that. Is, is that clear enough? As you don't need to go to the House of Lords now. You've said it all. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. well, okay, off you go. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs>
<laughs> right, Len, Europe, wealth taxes as well. Yeah, well, I mean, ocean. our colleague there who didn't think the 2017 manifest, manifest was radical enough, you're my man, you can come and join us to make it even more radical. And of course, as Torsten has said, uh, organizations like uh, Resolution Foundation and others are feeding in ideas. Uh, Rowena quite rightly pointed out that the, uh, the manifest building on, um, this was a manifesto that people spoke about. It sold more copies than any manifesto in history. It was what people actually uh, were speaking about on the doorstep. So does it need building on a shadow of doubt? And I'm quite certain that uh, the help of people and as we develop policies, it can become even more radical, including on the question of, of, of taxation. Um, Eve's point is this difficult one about is all labor just engaged in strategic prevarication? Uh, it's a lovely phrase. I mean, the truth is, of course, that the Labour Party is not at the negotiating table. It's the Tories that are negotiating, and therefore Labour has to respond to the real world. People have voted to leave the European Union. That was a vote. Now, we very rarely have referendums in this nation of ours. For us to try to interpret that vote, because it was a simple, straightforward vote, leads to dangers. And very often during the last election, the media and the TV were able to kind of get people in the streets saying, uh, especially in our northern towns and cities, well, uh, I voted Labour all my life, but I'm voting Tory this time because I don't believe Labour will take us out of the European Union. They'd lost trust or there was a, a lack of trust. Now, Labour and Corbyn are in a difficult position. Two-thirds of, of Labour voters, Labour members, voted to remain and still want to remain, as does my union. Um, but how then do you dismiss the idea of um, a referendum? that says, no, we're leaving. You leave yourself open to real danger of losing massive support in areas that voted leave. If you Now, that's why Andrew and others, or the colleagues of mine in the unions, have been raising the issue about uh, whatever the deal is should go back to the British people uh, to be voted on. Now, I personally... I wouldn't rule that out. I'm, I'm not saying I'm in favour of it or that my union's in favour of it. At the moment, we're in favour of Parliament uh, uh, scrutinising the deal. My personal hope and belief is that in late autumn of this year, the deal that comes back to Parliament will be rejected. It will lead to Theresa May having to resign and it will lead to an early general election in 2019. That becomes then a referendum. So Eve, it's certainly not a Labour leadership who is abandoning our young people and generations to come. The issue is what relationship can we have with Europe? Let me say this. My union campaigned to remain in the European Union, not because we were starry-eyed about the European Union because we weren't. We campaigned on the basis of remain and reform exactly what Corbyn and Macdonald campaigned on because the European Union had long since started to fray at the edges in terms of the social element, the social chapter that was originally offered to us by Dolores and others. So Europe is no great panacea. What really matters is what relationship do, do we have with Europe and if Jeremy Corbyn was the Prime Minister now and he was negotiating with Europe I believe that we would get a deal that satisfied the whole of our nation including Eve young people so it's a question of having some faith in the leadership but also recognizing these difficult waters that he has to navigate through which is a referendum on one hand, clear swathes of our Labour heartlands that voted leave, a Labour membership that two-thirds of which want to remain, 
And that is the kind of dichotomy that faces Corbyn, and I think he's doing a first-class job at the moment. Great. Rowena? Can I ask a question instead of answering? Go on, then. You are a journalist. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, Glenn, in what circumstances could you see um, yourself not ruling out a second referendum? So not, not uh, Theresa May actually having a, an, a, an election after the deal's been voted down by Parliament. W what are the situation, what situation could arise in which a, a, a referendum on the deal could happen? The one important thing for me, the one thing that I believe all progressive left people in our nation should be concentrating on, one thing only, removing this government. That should concentrate all our minds. How quickly can we remove this government? I believe it can be done by Parliament rejecting the deal that comes back and forcing a general election. If Parliament fail in that, that I'm prepared to kind of look at any other option because I don't want to wait till 2022. I believe the damage that is being caused to our industries and our communities by this government is so bad that just saying, well, okay, we'll have to wait till 2022, that's the way it is, is, um, is not a route that I want to go down. So at the moment, I'm clear, uh, late autumn goes to Parliament, Parliament defeats it, and we get an early general election. If Parliament fail us, and this is my fear, you know, Theresa May might come back with a deal that whilst the Labour leadership might disagree with it, there may be Labour politicians, pro-Europeans, who say, well, that's not a bad deal, and therefore we're not voting against uh, the, the, the government, because I believe uh, Theresa May will move more and more to a soft Brexit. So I'm relying and I'm hoping, Rowena, that the parliamentary uh, setup that we have will, de will defeat it. If they don't, then I'm prepared to look at any options. Great. The, um, right, Lisa, you're not allowed to ask a question, but you're allowed to give us something up. <laughs> well, I've given up predicting the future, so I can tell you I'm not answering Rowena's question okay. either. But, um, the, on uh, election day um, in 2017, the phone rang in my constituency office, and it was a, a woman who said, is that Lisa? And I said, yes. And she said, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God. You know, usually on election day, when people ring up your campaign office and say, I want to talk to you, it's going to take a while, and it's not going to be good. Uh, she said... Uh, what, I just want to say one thing to you, and it's this. Do not promise what you can't deliver. And I said, well, you know, I agree with that, to be honest. You know, fair enough. Um, and she said, because it's not your money, love, it's ours, and we haven't got a lot of it. it. I was thinking about it when you asked your question about taxes, because for me, this is the great uh, thing that Labour needs to confront over the next couple of years, is... You know, all credit to the Autism Manifesto. They had to put together a programme very quickly. We weren't expecting an election. And what they managed to do was to give people an idea about the boldness of Labour's offer. And we've heard things from John McDonnell recently, you know, floating ideas like universal basic income, which is quite controversial in my party, but still a live debate that is important for us to have. Um, but it means that you have to find a way of paying for it. And there's a reason why my constituents who have voted Labour consistently for over 100 years, care more about things like economic security, immigration, defence. And it's because when we get those things wrong, they're the people at the sharp end of it. They're the people who lose their houses and their jobs in a financial crash, who see the opportunities for their children disappearing. They're the people whose children go off to fight in wars if we get our national security policy wrong. So it seems to me that this is a really major area for the Labour Party. I can't, I can't give you any inside gossip about what we're planning to do because I'm not part of those discussions. But there was some interesting work done about taxing unearned wealth that I think is worth exploring for Labour, especially because I think working people shrinking as a, as a proportion of the population are having to bear far too heavy a burden at the moment. And it's something that all of us need to contribute to as part of that discussion. Um, just on the Brexit stuff, I voted Remain, I campaigned for Remain, I was in the Shadow Cabinet at the time, I went all over the country, mainly to our northern heartlands where people uh, were voting overwhelmingly to leave to try and make the case for Remain, and I would vote Remain again tomorrow if there was a second referendum, and I make no apology for that. But there's a reason why I think that Andrew is wrong 
about the referendum and it's this that if we had a referendum tomorrow I would vote remain again I suspect that you would find that the vote in places like Wigan would be even more heavily leave over the last few years pretty much all anyone's heard in this country is that the EU won't give us a good deal you know they're trying to screw us over they're trying to get rid of our protections they're trying to um, get a better deal for themselves that's coming from the Tories and he's right about that you know there is a a small part of the Tory party who has hijacked this agenda and are trying to persuade people of that message. It makes it even more important, in my view, that Labour has a different message about cooperation and collaboration, and like Len says, about what we want our future relationship with Europe to look like, um, not just uh, if we stayed in the European Union, but actually where I think we're going, which is to come out. And I think Keir has actually largely struck the right balance on this. Because if we tried to go back to the country uh, with a second referendum um, without any clear understanding of what prompted lifelong socialists and trade unionists and social democrats in towns like Wigan to overwhelmingly vote to leave, without any better offer on the table about the sort of future that they might expect with a second referendum on offer, I think they would send us straight back out there again and say, we told you to listen and you're still not listening. And that is too much of what I see going on in the Labour Party at the moment, is too many people not prepared to listen to the other side and not prepared to understand how it is that we ended up in this mess in the first place. So it seems to me, actually, that to jump straight from we had a referendum to a second referendum has completely missed the point of how we got here. And unless we have a much better vision on offer and active settlement for the 21st century, then Labour will not succeed. Great. Look, can we thank our panel for coming today? No, no. People have, I promised people seven minutes ago, Len, and I'm not going to break my promises. Well, I've already broken them anymore. But look, thank you all for coming. We've proven three things. There are big challenges for Labour, a big opportunity, but that you can have a debate holding on to solidarity. So have a good day, comrades. See you soon.